Meditation from Irish Wisdom Preserved in Bible and Pyramids by Conor McDurry. Every man must be his own priest before God. There can be no other, for every man must be his own saviour through his own Holy Spirit within himself. The Almighty God alone forgives sin, and the only mediator or intercessor that man needs, or for that matter, that he can have, is his own Holy Spirit within himself, if man merits his higher spirit. No priest can obtrude himself as the third person. It is only presumption on his part to make a pretense in doing so. As with everyone else, he has hard enough task to save himself, that is, to reach final perfection. The Bible, an Irish book, by Conor McDurry. Ford. Away back in 1908, while I was still a boy attending the grammar school grades, my father, Conor McDurry, explained to me that Jesus was merely a symbol of the sun. He further explained that many of the Bible stories were dramatizations of the sun's great influence on all the life on this planet, fulfilling its role as creator, preserver, and destroyer. Many of the enigmas and so-called miracles began to take on new meaning for me as the years passed. For instance, the story of the Last Supper, mentioning the changing of water into wine, became a description for, for nature's yearly performance of employing the rains and the vines to achieve the essence of the grapes. In later years, I read Robert Taylor's beautiful description of this miracle in the Devil's Pulpit. A few years later, in 1917, my father made the startling statement that the ancient Irish were the original authors of the Christian Bible and that the very names in this great work remain Irish to this day, although there seems to be a great impetus by the church divines to make, a radi to make radical changes under the announced pretense of simplifying the reading for the moderns. The fact is that there was never another language but the Irish rich enough in spiritual expression to portray so beautifully the fundamental ideas extolled for the sole purpose of helping and guiding erring mankind from the low depth of materialism back to the godlike state which is his true realm. Through the years I gradually realized that my father knew what he was talking about. In 1916, while a student at Dartmouth College, I took a course in archaeology and the activity in it was focused around Mesopotamia and ad adjacent areas in the Near East. In that very year, 1916, William Goodwin, Goodwin of Hartford, Connecticut, published a fine work, Greater Ireland in New England, if memory serves me well. It may have been called Greater Ireland in America, which described a stone village claiming to have been erected by the Irish prior to the time of Columbus. The author had, a pers had personally a 30 acres plot to preserve this momentous relic but there was little or no attention from the public press. The location of this Irish stone village is in New Salem, New Hampshire, one about 100 miles from Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, and yet it was in 1938 that I learned about it. Subsequently, I became cognizant of many items of information which support Conor McDurry's assertions. Such revelation, revelations include the following. One, the American Indians had a master language understood by the tribes from coast to coast, with the exception of two tribes. The name of this came from two Irish words, Algon and Hine, from which obtain Algonquin, meaning noble family. 2. Hubert Hull Bancroft, page 119, volume 2 of Native Races, mentions an, an Indian chief who said his tribe taught the children no other language but the Welsh Irish until they were 11 years old. 3. <coughs> The mounds and burrows of pyramid form were of druidical origin and receive very, very slight mention by American historians. There were 5,000 mounds in Ohio and over 10,000 in Michigan and Wisconsin. 4. The druidical type rocking stone in Sullivan County, New York, and the Great Serpent Mound, 1,500 feet long in Portsmouth, Ohio, got almost un entirely unmentioned. The researcher for information along these lines, and particularly about the scope of the worldwide influence of the Druids should read The Price of Peace by Stinston Jarvis, J.F. Rowney Press, Los Angeles, 1921, and The Travels in Tartary, being an account of two Roman priests, Abbe, Abbe Hook and Gabe. They were unfrocked for pointing out the similarity of the Roman and Tibetan political structures. Another work which should be read is that great monumental history Anapocalypsis by Godfrey Higgins. 
He pointed out that the Irish language is the oldest of which there is any knowledge, Hebrew being the next oldest, and Chaldee next. Higgins remarks that the Morning Herald of 1827 carried an item in effect that a Bible society passed out Hebrew Bibles to the Irish peasantry because they could understand them better than those written in English. <clears throat> now, it is my understanding that following this forward, there will be a printed a lecture on the Irish language, which I gave several years ago, and therefore I will bring these remarks to a, to a close to avoid repetition. I might add that Conor McDarry was born in County Kerry, Ireland, 1860. His parents were American citizens and had been married in Massachusetts. Due to the American Civil War, their return to America was delayed until 1866. My father served a term in the US Army in Washington State, 1877, during the Indian uprising of that period. I have his honorable dis discharge in my possession. His two sons, my brother and myself, also served in the Army and Navy respectively in World War I and received honorable discharges. The present public, and indeed more especially all posterity, owe a debt of thanks and appreciation to health research for its monumental production of so many important works dealing in subjects far off the beaten path and which otherwise might never become available to the general reader in this or future ages. Best wishes to all and most sincerely, Conor McDary Jr. January 24th, 1972. Preface. In a previous work written some years ago, the announcement was made of the discovery that the Bible was of ancient Irish origin and that its character names are still Irish. This statement was supported by irrefutable facts, including a list of synonymous words in both Irish and Hebrew, with derivatives of the latter, proving that the so-called Hebrew language was but a dialect improvised by the parent Irish language for the secret use of the ancient Irish priests of sun worship. Appreciating that this is a somewhat of startling and astounding disclosure of Hitherow's suppressed truth, to make it to the major part of the altogether unsuspecting peoples of the Christian countries of the world today, we awaited its reception with interest. To inquiring minds, it was a valued contribution, aiding in making the ages of the past historically a filled a void, a, it filled a void of silence. Inquiries came from overseas and from different parts of our country, requesting further light on the Bible topics, to which this present work is in part a response. It was in hope that someone would be energetic or ambitious enough to take advantage of the lead we had given and bring out a work along the lines indicated. This hope, from the difficult nature of the task, has not been realised. The present work is the fruit of years of labour and research. It seems now to have been too much to have expected any of the clergy who may have been able to make so radical a step and violate a silence on a, and violate a silence on a forbidden subject that has been maintained for generations. As for the laity, the recondite nature of the work would have been an obstacle, as will be noted in the elucidation of the Irish character in the following pages. The task has remained for us to do and to give further and absolute proof that the Bible is a product of ancient Irie. In connection herewith, we have given historical facts and deduce, deductions from these facts to show the wide influence, learning and culture of IRA in the ages post. It is only a few days ago that the Herald Tribune of New York City in its issue of August 22, 1928, announced that the leader of an expedition from an American museum had discovered proof that the Druids ruled the old continents and the former religion of the Tibet was of the fire or sun worship as of ancient Britain and Ireland. He also learned that the former name of the region around Lhasa was Gotha. But this but bears out facts already clearly discernible in the history of the people of ancient Ire, who for deceptive purposes called in our histories Phoenicians. The name Gotha is Irish and derived from the root word Goth, meaning spear, the weapon giving its name to the people so armed. In like manner, the people who anciently inhabited the plains of southern Russia were known by the name of the weapon they used in warfare. They were known as the Scythians, modern form Scythians, from the Irish word Sith, pronounced skith, and arrow. The warriors of that ancient nation were armed with bows and from the back of their fleet horses attacked their enemies with showers of arrows. Further proof of ancient Irish cultural preeminence comes from an unexpected quarter. 
in an interview published in a recent issue of the New York Times, September 23, 1928, a recluse, a former teacher and poet in Frankfurt, Germany, who knows well 200 languages and is proficient in their idioms, when asked which of the languages he considered the greatest, answered without any hesitation, Phoenician. Thus, from two recent and related sources comes corroborative evidence in support of the statements in these pages. It was our first intention to elucidate a great number of the character names that are here given, but it was found, as the work proceeded, that it would make an amount too large for one volume. Essayists and writers without number have treated Bible subjects and characters, some with but little idea of the esoteric meaning embodied in them. They seemingly assume that the Bible was like an unexplored or uncharted sea, regarding which random statements might be made on the theory that one man's guess was as good as another's. Such interpreters, whose teremity outsteps their knowledge, should find much for reflective thought on this in this exposition. This is the first time that the Bible characters have been elucidated and, so far as we know, translated directly from their Irish names and diffused for the benefit of all. In this exposition of the biblical ideas and in the elucidation of the character names in the Bible, we have endeavoured to make the meaning clear and truly present those, present those spiritual ideas of the ancient Druid Hebrew priests as embodied in these character names which are, though much disguised, eloquent, fulsome and complete and in themselves show the way to the eternal life as secretly and figuratively indicated by the Adit founders of early Irish Christianity of pre-Roman times. In memoriam, this volume is dedicated to the memory of my father, who in my early boyhood taught me the letters of the Irish alphabet, the initial step in which later years enabled me, with the aid of historical research, to interpret its character names and to prove the true source of the origin of the Bible. The Bible, an Irish book, an elucidation of its, of its character names. Chapter 1, a survey. One of the most astounding and most impressive facts which I have discovered in my search for this truth is that ancient Irae was the original homeland of the Aryan race, and the inhabitants of this island were the first civilized cultured people. This fact is indicated by the name Celtic, applied to the race from the word Celt, meaning clothes. This term has been used to distinguish them from the nomadic aboriginal or uncivilized races of mankind. It was in Irae, an ancient name of Ireland, that the arts and sciences were first discovered and cultivated. It was there also that the first schools and universities were established. Furthermore, it was from that centre of learning that the gifts of letters, the first alphabets and the truths of religion were spread by Irish apostles and missionaries of the ancient sun worship, now called Christianity, which gets its name from the Irish word creos, meaning a cross, a band or circle, and is an idiomatic name for the Irish name for the sun. The Irish word less, spirit, and essay, seed, fluid, in its highest aspect implies the spirit of God in the sun, and in its lower or human aspect is the divine spark, spirit or essence in man. Hence, Iesa Creost, Jesus Christ, is the personal God or saviour of every human being. This idea of the correspondence of man in a spiritual sense with his creator had its inception in the first cult or order of priesthood of ancient Irae. They were the master adepts who first explored and discovered the secrets of nature and man. This they did, both from within and externally, in man and physical nature. We have reason to believe that they were reincarnated into this round or period of existence in order to fulfill a mission, to serve as guides and teachers, to bring order out of chaos, and to organize the primitive backwards races of mankind to devise laws and rules for their governance and discipline. The Brihun, judges, laws of Ire were, without a doubt, the most ancient code of laws on earth. It was under the guidance and instruction of those first great teachers that that there developed in the land of Irae that cult of wise men who are known to us by tradition and in cryptic lore as the ancient magi or magicians of Irae. It was the great adept order of priesthood whose history has been suppressed like that of the island itself, 
but the memory of which is secretly preserved in mythic form in secular or profane history and in our Irish sacred book, the Bible. In his Antiquities of the Celte, F. Pezron shows that the Celte were the same as the Titans, the giant race, that is intellectual and spiritual giants, and that their princes were the same with the giants of scripture, and that the word Titan is perfect Celtic and comes from tit, the earth, and ten, or den, man. This fact, as to their identity, is also secretly confirmed under the cryptic term Fomorian, a race that are said to have once inhabited ancient Irae. The definition of the name Fomorian identifies them with the Titans and is proof positive that the name was formulated to secretly identify the cult of intellectual and spiritual giants who developed in and occupied ancient Ireland. And they are known to us in our Irish Bible as the Hebrew prophets, seers, priests, princes and kings. The name Fomorian is composed of two Irish word syllables. Fo, meaning a king or a prince, good, honour, esteem, powerful, mighty, and in comparison, as in this case, implies rarity, and the second syllable, more, meaning great, noble, big, bulky, hence Fomorian, the great, big, good, noble, and rare spiritual and intellectual giants, the Magian cult. It was this ancient cult of adepts who first formulated religion into a system and composed the religious myth which have been secretly preserved as an heirloom of the race and embodied with many alterations and interpolations as well as deletions in our modern Bible. This will be amply shown in this exposition and elucidation of the Irish names of places and Irish name characters in this, our mother book of all Bibles, the most ancient of sacred scriptures. The facts are given herein regarding the original source of our Bible were suppressed by Britain and Rome, as both of these powers profited by the overthrow of the Irish national church and state. The former profited politically and commercially, and the latter by the acquisition and absorption of the Irish national church, saviour, Bible and papacy. This conquest and absorption of the Irish church was without a doubt in the writer's mind the most important and momentous event in the whole history of the Roman church an event which has changed and affected the entire course of subsequent history even to this day. This conquest enabled the Roman pontiff to plume himself of the supreme pontiff, which distinction was formerly held by the Irish Pope Kings, whose seat was at Tara. This Irish pontiff was the supreme pope and the spiritual leader of all organised religions on this earth. It was the priests of the Irish National Church of Iesa Creost who spread the knowledge of religion and of God throughout the earth. With the conquest and suppression of the Irish Church, Rome assumed full sponsorship for the Irish saviour Ayesa and gave him a new dress, historically speaking, and translated his name as Jesu in her Latin tongue. She also appropriated the, Bible, the Irish Bible and sacred literature and religious appurtenances of the worship of, worship of Ayesa. This saviour, Ayesa Creost, was worshipped in the form of sun worship for Is is the spirit of God in the sun, and his replica is the Is or the spirit of God in the Esse or seed fluid in the man. It is from this fact and conception of the Irish Adips that the heavenly orb is called the sun, son of God. It was the conception of the master Adeps of ancient Irae that the Lord's son was the Logos or word that is he, emanated from the great unseen deity, was uttered by him, hence... <coughs> He is the word. This conception of the ancient priests of the sun worship is still adhered to by the Roman Church and all Christendom without acknowledgement to the Adept priests of the Irish Church of Iessa. They were the first to conceive these ideals and they formulated them under the form of sun worship, an esoteric or outward explanation of which was given to the multitude or congregation, the esoteric or hidden truths of which were reserved for the priest. Sun worship is still, and we believe rightly so, the religion of Christendom and Jesus, the anglicised name of Iessa, is the sun god. How Rome first as a political empire and later as the Roman church religious institution under the papacy laboured and conspired with the aid of Britain to acquire possession of these religious accessories aforementioned and the measures adopted to conceal the facts and to secure herself from being fully exposed is fully set forth in another work.
in connection with sun worship, it will be seen that Hebrews were the ancient Irish priests of the sun. This, that this is a fact needs only to be explained for anyone to be convinced of its truth. That Christianity came from Judaism is acknowledged by churchmen, but it never has been truthfully divulged before where Judaism had its origin and home, or who were the Hebrews and the Jews. The term Hebrew and Jew for deceptive purposes has been conferred upon a people of Aramaic race, and it is a misnomer to call this people the modern so-called Jews, either Hebrews or Jews. These are the names which pertain to and belong exclusively to the followers and the priest of the sun worship. The word Hebrew is the name of the Irish priest of the fire, the Vesta of the ancient Irish. The name is formed from the Irish root word Ea or I, fire. The original word, word name of this cult in Irish is Abrach. In translating it for purposes of deception and concealment, the doctors placed an H before the first letter of the word and made the word Hebrew. Hebrew, Hebrew. The word Jew has been formed from the Irish word Yud, meaning the day. As the day is an aspect of the manifested sun god, his followers or devotee was called an Yud. In formulating the modern English word Jew, doctors have substituted the letters J-E for L-U and W for D-H, and thus we have the word Jew. The original word is a perfect Irish idiom and etymon. All through the Bible such deception will be observed. In the translation from the original Irish scriptures, the Irish names were changed by the practice of the most astute cunning in order to conceal the source from which they were obtained. In many instances, these names have been distorted and misspelled to such an extent that it has required long and sustained patient effort to trace them back to their true and proper form. So it will be seen that the doctors have made a play on the Irish names in our Irish Bible in order to conceal their derivation and also their interest in meaning. These names are undeniably Irish and associated with the sun worship. By such methods and alterations and garbling, as well as by inflicting and distorting them in every way, they have succeeded until now in defeating and baffling the efforts of investigators to discover the true source from which we obtained our Bible. It is the facts here and disclosed, and in the evidence of which is so abundantly present even in the Bible itself today, that cause the Irish language, which is, according to Max Muller, one of the most perfect ever evolved to be indicated, interdicted and suppressed. <clears throat> in the succeeding pages will be given the definition and meaning of the names and characters according to the ideals of the ancient Irish priests of the sun. They compose those myths from which parables are drawn and lessons given to hold the interest of the laity or uninitiated. They also conveyed secretly profound lessons of instruction and wisdom to the priests or initiates. To the latter was taught the secret doctrine or the law of evolution and growth of the soul through effort in the material body or flesh. This law is cryptically contained in those Irish myths in our Bible and will be elucidated as the work proceeds. This presupposes and implies the fact of reincarnation. This idea is ever present and esoterically or secretly permeated the entire scriptural narrative. The burden of these myths is generation after generation or birth after rebirth of the ego or personality, which is but that one of one ego with due allowance for the introduction of a number of characters to give variety and interest to the story and the myth, being born and reborn many times successively, under different names into an earthly body. Each life in the body adds its sum of wisdom to that already acquired, and which cumulatively, in time, enables the ego or self to achieve self-conquest or mastery over the lower nature. The ego, having by this means emancipated himself from the necessity of rebirth in the body, achieves regeneration or birth into his solar or spiritual body. The ancient Irish mythical saviour Ayesa Kriost is the perfect man and ideal character which was formulated by those ancient adepts of the sun worship to exemplify this profound truth. He achieved emancipation and arrived at a state of godhood in union with the Creator. With the foregoing brief elucidation, regarding the generally little understood law of the evolution of the soul and the popular ignorance regarding the suppressed history of the past ages and of the true source from whence we obtained our Bible, we will now consider the first topic of the book of Genesis, the creation. Chapter 1 
Chapter 2, The Creation. A most singular fact to be noted and explained is that we find embodied in mythologies of the religions of the older nations a spiritual conception of the creation of the universe cryptically presented to us in one form or another. The true explanation for this correspondence has never been before, I believe, been correctly accounted for by investigators or writers on biblical subjects. In these myths, while they vary somewhat in their external form, we can easily perceive from their nature that they must have originated in and proceeded from a common source. The variation of those myths is due to the fact that they were formulated to suit the genius of each particular race to whom they were given. Many of the variations, no doubt, are due in great measure to the later changes which time brings about in religious ideas, rites and observances, as in all things else, and to the peculiar trend of thought of the various races due to effective food, climate and environment. But in all, there is a similarity through the origin of those creation myths that can be traced directly to the Magian adept priesthood of ancient Irene. This priesthood, from time to time, sent out colonies and missionaries to preach the gospel of Aiesa Krios to the sun god. Humanized and in allegorical form as a self-sacrificing saviour for the redemption of sin until they finally circled the whole earth. They established priesthoods and instituted religious worship and forms among the various races of the ancient world. They also introduced alphabets and schools of instruction into the countries which they visited. As these pilgrimages are noted in our histories as the Aryan migrations, or are referred to variously as the Aryan invasion of Greece, Egypt, India, etc. However, there is but very brief mention made of them, as in fact accounts of their true character and purpose have been purposely suppressed, like the history of ancient Ireland itself. The reason for the suppression will become obvious to the reader as the discourse of truth proceeds in these pages. Those adept priests were the first order of men to discover the secrets of nature and the unity of the universe. They were the first to study the science of the stars and the cosmos. These they metaphorically likened unto beings and powers and embodied them as mythical forms and personages. So to this early Aryan priesthood of Aire, who circled the known world to give a knowledge of God and of religion to the backward and underdeveloped races of that early day, we can unmistakably attribute the origin of those religious myths dealing with the creation of the world. Those myths contain cryptically an advanced and enlightened understanding of the deific and creative powers and forces of God in nature, such as no rude or barbarous peoples could possibly have had any original conception or knowledge of. The uninstructed mind was incapable of comprehending much less formulating those myths. Their construction presupposes an intimate and profound knowledge of the laws of nature and of the heavens, such as was never possessed by an uncultivated order class or race in the whole history of mankind. This order of adepts was known throughout the ancient world as the Magian priesthood of Aire. In our present day histories of Ireland, they are relegated to the realm of mere legend and hazy tradition under the appellation of Tuathadanans, Titans and Fomorians, though all of our culture and civilization bear their indelible impress. That this priesthood established sun worship on this American continent is evidenced by the ruins of cities and temples in various parts of both North and South America. There are no less than 62 ancient ruined cities in Yucatan and Mexico that very like owe their origin or culture to this ancient priesthood. They introduced here the worship of the sun and the fire. Those pyramids, sphinx, obelisks and round towers all associated with the sun worship bespeak their authorship and handiwork. The ancient Mexicans knew the month of December by the Irish name of Ayes Kali, or little Ayesa, the sun Irish god. The word, the word Kali signifies in Irish small or little. So, in the month of, in which the little Ayesa, or the young sun god, was born, our Christmas, December 25th, this month was hieroglyphically represented by men holding up a boy by the hair of their head that is raising him, symbolizing the birth of the young son, I.S., the ancient Irish saviour, now called Jesus, wherever the English language is spoken. After all, it is not so surprising that the very existence of those myths of the creation, as well as their points of similarity, has resulted in causing confusion in the minds of many critics as how to, 
how it happened to be so. Owing to the suppression of the history of ancient Ayre, this need may not be wondered at all. If the history of Ayre has been preserved for posterity, there would not be any mystery about the origin or similarity of those myths or of our Bible, and no explanation would be necessary. In these myths, the creative powers take the various forms of gods and goddesses, as well as objects such as water, mountains, trees, snakes, bulls, oxen, rams, etc. Each end, all of, all of these symbolize the active and passive principles in nature, each giving aid and assistance, and bringing forth the incipient world into manifested form. These ideas indicating as they do, so much of esoteric wisdom point unerringly to a common ancestry for these world myths of the, of the creation. Our Aryan forefathers brought the idea of the creative or world tree with them from Ayre to the different countries and peoples where we now find them. Therefore, the Irish were the first people to use the symbol of the tree in their worship of God. They venerated the oak tree as a sacred symbol of the creative power of the sun god, and they held ceremonial services to him in the oak groves, as we latter-day so-called Christians now do in our churches. The fact that the symbol of the tree was so widely prevalent and common to so many of the ancient mythologies caused the Reverend Joseph B. Gross, who was evidently perplexed to account for this fact, to say, in the heathen religion and its popular and symbolical development, page 242, quote, the mythologies of other nations also claim and celebrate their mundane trees, and it is exceedingly probable that the Scandinavian Yggdrasil was the th once the thrifty scion of one of these ancient trunks." End quote. Had he turned aside in his investigations from the well-beaten path, so carefully prepared to lead the unwary astray, and given his efforts and research to investigating early Ireland and the Irish language, he would have had his surmise as to the Yggdrasil being a scion from an older trunk language. From an older, oh, sorry, from an older trunk confirmed, and his curiosity transformed into a conviction as he would have discovered there the parent trunk of the world tree. That he may have been an honest investigator led astray by the following by following in the footsteps of others is indicated by his query on this point, page two forty three. Quote: What is it natural to ask gave rise to these myths of the world trees? Are they playful productions of the fertile fantasies, fantasies of the poets, or have they a basis in reality? Who was able to penetrate through the grey mist of ages and laying barefoot of the first Yagrasil? Say, here is the beginning of the world tree myths. I will submit evidence right here to substantiate the fact and prove beyond the possibility of a doubt that the Norse tree is a scion from the Irish world tree. Max Muller says that evidence exists which indisputably connects the ancient nations and points to a common origin. Such evidence, he says, exists in their names of the deity, prayer, worship, altar, law, etc. By such incontrovertible evidence will those myths be shown to have been formulated by those early Aryan adept masters of Ayre. This is all in correspondence with our first claim that the ancient Irish were the fountainhead of our civilization and culture, and the first evangelists to form religious ideas, and, if I may use modern term, to broadcast them to the whole world. I believe Max Muller knew of this fact well, but dare not say in so many words. He all but says so. His in inferences easily lead us up to this truth, but he was a professor of languages at Oxford University in England, and if he disclosed his convictions openly, he surely would have ended his usefulness and <laughs> have lost his standing and popularity with the ruling classes of that country. How many of the professors in our American colleges are today likewise suppressing themselves and, to use a colloquialism, pussyfooting or soft-pedaling towards the future Elysian fields of a Carnegie pension paddock? So, in view of what has been said, it is not at all surprising to find that the Scandinavian world myth the figure of the Yagrazil tree, that is to be said the ash tree, for the reason that the ash is more common in the northern latitudes than is the oak. And as it, it is the most natural thing that the priest would use as a symbol the tree common to the region and people for whom it was intended. That this world tree came from the early Aryan priesthood can be easily and directly traced through the name of the tree itself, and also the very names of the Norse gods 
prove unmistakably that they originated from the same source. The name Yggdrasil, stripped of its fanciful spelling, is Yggdrasil, and is a compound word composed of three Irish word syllables, Yg, meaning flesh, dry, a druid, and seal, to drop, shed, or to sow its seed. The etymology of the name Yggdrasil proves to be a druidical tree of unmistakable Irish parentage. Ireland being the head and chief centre of sun worship and of the druidical system. To the inspired imagery of the priest Magian cult, we may attribute the first inception of the idea of the tree as a symbol of the deity and the creation, and this inference may, be clearly, may clearly be drawn without any strain on one's credulity from the following Irish words and their definitions embodying and set, setting forth, as they do, the ideals of the ancient Irish druids. The comprehensive word dual which is the root word for one of the many names for God, will help to make this apparent. This word means an element, a creature, a being, delight, pleasure, desire, hope, partition, distribution. These are all, in their superlative aspect, qualities and attributes of deity. In dwil, God, and the same word dwil, a leaf of a tree, a fold, a sheath. Dwilech, foliage, leafy, full of leaves, and Dwilama, God, creator, bring out the same idea. Thus it will be seen that the tree was a pristine and idyllic symbol of the Irish Druids and was used as a figure in the conception of God in the creation. The foregoing definitions, which anyone may look up and verify for himself, imply an unfolding from within, and the emanation of the universe from the deity is the leaf as the leaves unfold outwardly from within the tree. This world tree, in its highest aspect, represents the creative power of God, and inversely, in its lower or human physical aspect, it represents the male organ of generation. Thus, cognate word dul, signifying a pin, a peg, is plainly a phallic symbol, and its Irish derivation can, cannot be longer disputed or denied. In the days of the pre-Greek and pre-Roman ascendancy, when the Irish, the Phoenicians of history, under their Pope Kings, ruled practically over the whole world, and their rule, we have reason to believe, was undisputed to any extent for thousands of years. The Norse and the Teutons were under the rule of the Irish sovereigns and spoke a Gaelic dialect. The Teutonic speech shows that it is derived from the Irish root words. This is the main reason why we find so many among the German professors who have studied Gaelic. In fact, we are told of a coordinate fact, which is, that the German became a cultured language owing to its ability to absorb and assimilate the Celtic. The name Teuton is from the Irish word Tuat, meaning a lord, the lay of a country, a lordship, northern, the north, hence the Teutonic or northern race. As the Irish were the first cultured and civilised race, and their priesthood the first to disseminate religious ideas, it should not be surprising to us to find, on honest investigation, that many of the Scandinavian and Teutonic gods are of Irish origin. Thus, we find the Scandinavian sun god Balder is derived from the older Irish sun god Baal. Baal. This latter, we are told, is a sun god of the Phoenicians. But as I have shown conclusively that the Phoenicians and the Irish were one and the same people, it establishes the identity of the homeland or parentage of these mythical names of the sun god. Even to this day, after seven centuries of Roman church domination, the custom of lighting the Baal fire is still followed in Ireland in veneration of the ancient rite to the sun god Baal on the eve of May 1st every year. And this day is called La Bultain, or Day of Baal's Fire. <coughs> the, name, <coughs> the name Phoenician is but a formulated one, purposely misspelled and secretly applied to, to obscure the past history of the Irish race previous to the 12th century in order to conceal from posterity and more especially from the succeeding generations of the Irish race, all knowledge of the manner and means by which the Roman Church gained a foothold in Ireland. This foothold was secured for her by the event of the English invasion of the island in the year 1169 AD by King Henry II of England. This invasion of Ireland was instituted by King Henry at behest of Nicholas Breakspear, an Englishman who had been elected Pope of the Roman Church in the expectation that, being an Englishman, he would very likely be successful in enlisting the English king 
in the Roman church scheme to, to invade and conquer the island. This was to further the age-long policy of the Roman church to conquer and get position of the Irish church, the mother Christian church of the world, with its immense wealth in lands, buildings, flocks and herds, as well as the great monastic establishments. At that time and event, it was accomplished and fulfilled Rome's long-standing and persistent ambition to acquire position of the Irish church with its religious appetences, with its age-old papacy, the most ancient on earth, the saviour Iesa Christ, and the Irish Bible, as will be seen from the import of these pages. After the conquest of the Irish church and the suppression of its papacy, the Roman bishop could now, without fear of a rival, pose as the undisputed pope of Western European Christendom. To conceal the truth about the events related here from the eyes of mankind, it has been the potent cause for the suppression of the, of the authentic history of the past and the fabrication and falsification of history by the priests and monks in their writings dealing with ancient and medieval times. With the aid of foregoing elucidation, the reader will be enabled to comprehend the covert intent of the priest scribes in formulating the term Phoenician as the secret designation of the Irish race, the significance of which was to be understood solely by the knowing ones. The priests have practiced the deceits by the use of ambiguous words and also by the use of incorrect spelling of words. Thus, the name Phoenician, if spelled correctly, would be Phoenician, meaning a sun worshipper or follower of the sun. The Irish word is Finn, meaning a sun, family or tribe. True, white, fair, pleasant, a name of the sun, an Irish man. Hence, Phoenicians were an order or caste of the devotees of the sun. Without making known to us in any way whatsoever the true identity of Phoenicians, our histories tell us that they were the greatest navigators and traders, as well as the greatest commercial nation of ancient times. For the name Phoenician, substitute the word Irish and it will aid partly, but only in part, drawing aside the veil which has been hidden Ira's past history from our view. This, this illustrates one of the means employed in camouflaging and suppressing the history of Ireland. All this evidence of fact that sheds more light on ancient Aire has been the homeland and original source from which came the world tree myth of the creation. This assertion is confirmed by the fact that from Aire came the Scandinavian god Thor. The name is derived from the Irish word Tor, meaning noble, a sovereign, lord, and the Irish word Toran, thunder, and the god Thor is called the thunderer. The god Woden is also derived from the Irish. This Norse god is known under different forms of appellation according to the inflection placed upon the word, such as Woden, Odin, Odin, Wodan, Wotan, and Votan. These are all variants of this name of the Norse sun god and denote the small, short, or diminished sun. The Irish word is bo, meaning fire, light. This word, owing to Norse euphony, has become inflected to wo, o, o, and ro. The terminations, din, dan, and tan, denoting the diminutive. So, wotan is the little fire, or the low sun in the northern heavens, which gives forth but little heat and light. Furthermore, it is from this word bow, fire, light, that the Irish Pope Kings derive their distinctive appellation and title as Pope. The word Bowban denotes the head of the fire or sun worship. It also indicates the diminutive, that is, the little fire or light, as compared with the great heavenly fire or light of the sun. As the Irish Pope King was at the head of the fire or sun worship, he naturally received the title of Bolban, meaning a papa, father or pope. This distinction and title was his exclusively, having descended through a long line of inspired men from hoary antiquity whose types are preserved in our Irish Bible, such as Jeremiah, Isaiah and Malachi. These are three distinctively Irish names and are prophetic representatives of the sun worship. The name Isaiah is from Ayes, spirit, denoting the creative sun, and Malachi, Mal a king, is from Mala, the summit or brow of a hill, denoting the highest, the highest the sun. The name Jeremiah has been distorted 
by the reviser for camouflage. The true form of the name is Eremit, from the root word Ier, the west, the same as Aire, the west. So the prophet Jeremiah is the westerner, who speaks in no uncertain tones, as if with a mandate from above, and may well denote the figure of the Irish Pope King, the representative on earth of the heavenly sun god, as Aire, the west, was the home and chief shrine of the Christian sun worship. Thus we can see that the title Pope developed as a natural proceeding, a logical outcome and growth pertaining to the head of the fire or sun worship. It belonged to no other and all others since claiming the title have been usurpers. The power of the sword can never confer such a title. And right here before passing on, I wish to state a very significant fact which is corroborative of the definition of the word Boban, a papa, father or pope, and the root word Boe, from which is derived the god Oidin. It is this, Oidin is called the father of the Norse gods. In the world creation myth of the Persians, we also find the tree as a creative figure. This tree, as we are told, was inverted with its roots in the heavens and its branches extended downwards. As with the Norse, the Persians also received their first ideals of God and of religion from the early Aryan priesthood. The evidence of this is so convincing that we need not seek further to account for the source from which they obtained their early religious institutions, rites and myths. It has been shown by investigators that the Persian or Turanian race is an offshoot from the main body of that Irish migration. I will disclose a most convincing bit of evidence if not to confirm this fact, at least to show from where they obtained their early religious ideas and culture, it is this. In the Persian myth of creation, the first human pair that emerged from the mythical world tree and were born upon this earth were named respectively Mishya and Mishani. These are two unmistakable Irish named characters. The first man and woman in the Persian myth answer the same as do Adam and Eve in our Irish Bible myth and that both of these pairs of first parents came from the same source and are the product of the imagery of the ancient priests of Aire. There is no room for doubt. The name Meshia is an idiomatic Irish word and means a basket or packet, spirit, and in the myth it means the man in the basket or package, implying the fetus or the fetus in the mother's womb. <coughs> Meshiani is the feminine of Meshia. If there if there were no other evidence extant but this fact alone, under the circumstances of the suppression of early Aryan history, it would be sufficient to prove to us the source from which the Persians obtained their world tree myth of the creation. I believe that it is to an oversight rather than to any intent of neglect to destroy on the part of the obscurantists that we may attribute the preservation of these names in the Persian account of the creation. Or I may ask is it due to the thought of fancied security due to apathy and remoteness of location, or that the evidence was so secure, securely hidden beneath the cloak of the myth that its identity as to authorship and parenthood would escape discovery? Whatever the cause, I believe that those agencies which have so zealously and sedulously suppressed the ancient history of Irie would never knowingly have allowed such convincing evidence to come down to posterity, identifying as it does, this early Irish priesthood with those world myths. These facts prove beyond the possibility of contradiction the universal extent of the labours of the Irish apostles in spreading the gospel on behalf of the Irish national church and the religion of Iesa Kriost, the saviour and son God. The discovery of this and other facts as herein disclosed show us clearly why ancient history has been suppressed and why such distortion was practised in that part of it which has been preserved and prepared for us. That the Persians got their chief gods from the ancient Irish is indubitable. The ev evidence of it is seen in the name of their supreme deity, Zuruani Achillini. Zir is from the Irish root word Zoh, bright, clear, the sun, and Ayan, a circle, also the name of the sun. Akareni is from the Irish word Kieran, black, dark. Hence, Zuruani Achillini. Akirene is the sun is the god of light and darkness, the two opposites, the active and passive principles in nature, the sun god. The name of the Persian god Ormuzd is from the Irish word root word or, 
the, the east, the sun god. Zoroaster, the personified sun god, and the Archmagus, or saviour of the Persian fire worship, gets its name from the root word Zoh, as Zor. It's but a variant form of this Irish word, and Asta is from the Irish Aousa, God. So Zoroaster is the bright god, the sun, with attributes of human personality. The Hindu mythology of the creation is also traceable to the Uri Aryan priesthood of the sun worship, who gave the Hindu people the first knowledge of God and established sun worship among them. This is easily recognized on examination. The Hindu trinity consists of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, which will be seen to be modelled after the Irish, ancient Irish trinity of the religion of Ayesa, which consists of father, brother and son. This comprehends the male-female principles of creation and the offspring, the sun, sun. The god Brahma gets his name from the Irish word feeling, being, consciousness. Therefore, the god Brahma, the great breath, who gave the breath of life to the world and to all living things. He is the Vedic god of the breathing and awakening world. Vishnu is the sun in this trinity, as the name comes from the Irish root word mach, which is also mich, and when inflected becomes vich, pronounced vich, sun, hence, hence vichnu, the sun. The name mach shemos in Irish when the prefix is inflected, becomes Vikshamos, the son of James. In the written form of the name of this Hindu god, the letter S is sometimes substituted for the letter C, and this has helped to conceal the parent source whence this deity derives his name. The god Siva, the last of the triad, is the same as, the, as in the ancient Irish church trinity. Some there may be who will be disposed to quibble over this comparison and say that the Holy Ghost is spirit, which is obvious. But so also is Siva meant for the Holy Spirit, and like the Holy Ghost, represents the feminine or mother principle of God or the Creator in the Trinity. This fact is additional proof that our religious ideas, doctrines, Bible and Saviour, which belonged to one religious system, the sun worship, were spread around the world by the priesthood of the ancient Irish church and religion of Aesa. The metamorphosis of the god Siva as a male deity of malefic and hideous aspect was a subsequent accre accretion with the object of inducing terror in the minds of worshippers. Surely no one can be so dull as to consider for a moment that this parallel between these two trinities is owing to a later introduction into India of Western religious ideas through Roman missionary effort. This could not possibly be so, as this Hindu trinity is older than the Roman church itself, and the great secret of the past is now disclosed that those religious ideas originated in ancient Iraq before Rome was founded. The Aryan priesthood brought the idea of the Trinity with them to India, as well as to both North and South America, before ever Rome was conscious and began to preen her feathers for a flight towards acquiring world domination, world dominion, either as a city, state, empire or church power. Rome itself was but an Irish Phoenician church colony and trading center. The etymology of the word Rome proves that it is of Irish derivation. This fact is secretly preserved in the myth of Romulus and Remus, the fabulous founders of the city. This is explained in Irish wisdom preserved in the Bible and Pyramids, page 115 and 116. One of the easiest and most effective ways to promote a deception is by the misspelling of words, when the reader is not aware of the fact. This can be readily seen in a changed form of the common, everyday English word, bought, under the proposed reform spelling method. How many of us would be likely to recognize this, un this familiar word, not being aware of the proposed change in spelling and seeing it for the first time in its new form? Unless there is sane curiosity aroused or interest taken to look it up, we could be easily deceived by it. Thus bought becomes bot, thought becomes thought, etc. This peculiar liability of men to be deceived by words and names when they are presented in, dis in, in disguised and abbreviated or unfamiliar forms of spelling has been taken full advantage of by the obscurants, who have in some ways secreted and in other ways suppressed the history of the past ages. The very peculiar features of the spelling of the words in the Gaelic lends itself to this form of deception in the translation into other languages and especially into English. 
This deception has been practiced in the presentation of the names of biblical and historical characters and personages. How this change in the form and spelling of words affects it is well illustrated by the word named Siva. The Irish word is Sivan and pronounced Shivan. In this word, as will be noted, is embodied the conception of the Irish priestly ideals, physically and metaphorically, of the sun. This word is a compound of the words Sival, abbreviated to the first syllable Siu, and the second Van from Ban or Baum. The first syllable of the word conveys the meaning of going, moving, motion, march, travelling, and the last syllable Van means a woman and also bright, shining, and brilliant aspects, fem feminine attributes of beauty applied to the sun god. As Siva, she is the bright, shining, and brilliant aspect of the sun and the mother principle in the Hindu trinity. Shivan is a popular name among the Irish woman, woman folk even to this day. In the, county of Ireland in, in the south of Ireland, in Kerry County, is an ancient town whose very name commemorates this idea or aspect of the sun god. It is the town of Kerr Vashin, from Kihir, Kihir City and Shivin, the bright, shiny aspect, hence the city of the sun. These facts cannot be controverted, and obscurantism cannot forever pre prevent investigators from recognizing the most obvious facts and truths as to the source from which we obtain the first world myth of the creation. That the Hindu Saviour Buddha is of ancient Irish derivation is, upon investigation, easily discernible. This ideal saviour is manifestly a creation of the early Aryan missionary priesthood given to them by the Hindus to worship. He is the sun god personified. His name of Gautama Buddha makes this very clear to us. The name Gautama is from the Irish root word gut, meaning a spear, a ray or beam, a sunbeam, and ma, meaning pure good, which tells us that he is the personified sun. The Irish name character Gautam the son of Eliphaz, from the same root word, is found in Genesis XXXVI, semicolon 2, and Buddha is formed from the Irish word Bud, meaning the world, universe, life, being, existence, virtue, power, wise, intelligent, skillful. These are all qualities and attributes of deity, and proves to us that Gautama Buddha is an Irish formulated name for the sun god. I will discuss here one more of the important gods of Hindu pantheon. The Hindu god Varuna bears an Irish name. It is an Irish name for the sun, the root word of this name being Ayr, pronounced Ar. This word, when inflected, becomes Var, hence Varuna. The Irish word Ayr means the east, to watch, to arise, all these being, being aspects of the sun. The word also means the air and the sky. And we find that true to this definition, Varuna is called a sky god, the sun. This array of facts is clear and sufficient evidence to prove the common source whence came originally our religious ideas and creation myths. The character of this proof is sufficiently clear in its nature to show the connection of these world myths and their similarity bespeaks their common parentage and reveals them as a product of the inspired priesthood of ancient Ayuri. This is evident despite the temporary success of those designing propagandists who have been persistently engaged in obscuring this important fact from the knowledge of men. In endeavouring to do this, they have deluged the world with an enormous mass of literature, spreading misleading and false information to perpetuate historical and religious deceits. While we now know that our Bible myth of the creation has taken over from the ancient Irish religion of Ayes it did not become it did not come to us undiluted and perfect as they had it. All through the Bible, the alterations, as well as the fabrications of names, betray the handiwork of the Roman and British doctors. To prove this fact at once, I will cite here in an instance from the book of Genesis, chapter X6, which will serve as an example of the interpolations and fabrications committed by the British doctors, an instance which is now revealed for the first time. This verse reads, In the sons of Ham, Cush, and Mizarim and Fut and Canaan. When this verse is explained, it will be recognized at once as secretly containing and setting forth the religious philosophy and spiritual ideas of the ancient Irish adept priesthood of the religion of Ayesa. The doctrine of truth esoterically contained in this verse implies that salvation is an individual and personal task for each and every human being to accomplish. 
When we consider the, the fact that this truth was discovered and formed into dogma and preserved in allegorical form in what is now our Bible by this ancient priesthood, thousands of years before the city of Rome was even founded, to say nothing of the modern form of English speech, which was developed but yesterday by comparison, we are enabled easily to, preserve, to perceive the interpolation in the translated version of the Bible by King James Reviser of the English name Han, meaning literally the hips or buttocks, the seat of generative principle in man. In the word Cush, the Irish original name has been preserved and the thought that no English speaking person or no other among the laity for that matter would, if, would be able to understand it. And as the Irish language was interdicted and doomed to suppression to help preserve, to, to help preserve the deceit from being discovered, they felt safe in retaining, though under considerable disguise and manipulation, the names of the characters in the translations from the Irish version. Thus, Cos, the Irish word purposely misspelled Cush, means a foot, and in the text under consideration cryptically means a wayfaring man, a traveller, that is, a spiritual traveller, to wit, a soul seeking spiritual enlightenment, an advancing soul, in other words, a man striving to live the good life in order to overcome his lower sensual nature, lusts, passions and appetites, and emancipate himself from the necessity of being born and reborn into a fleshly body. In brief, to perfect himself, like his ideal exemplar, the saviour Ayesa Christos, and enter into possession of his own solar or spiritual body. This is the secret ideal of every true priest or enlightened man, no matter to what denomination or organisation he, he may outwardly belong. So in correspondence with this word kush, the foot, we can see at once the flagrancy of the forgery and interpolation of the translating reviser by inserting in the text on behalf of Ham another son called Foot, foot thus anticipating far in advance for, pur for, for purpose of deception, modern euphonic spelling and naming him after his original Irish brother Cush, the Foot. In just this one instance of the character name Foot, the fraud and deception practiced by the doctors and the reviser of the Bible was revealed in such a manner that anyone can understand they were translating from the original Irish text, or from one that had retained the character names from the original Irish. The other sons of Ham, Mizraim and Canaan are Irish named characters and will be explained later. The version of the creation as given in the first chapter of Genesis is also, I believe, a forgery. It is evidently a garbled account of the creation inserted by the Roman doctors in the year 1208 AD and subsequently subscri subscribed to or endorsed by King James doctors in their revision of the Bible, which work began in the year 1608 and was completed in 1611. The character of, the ver of this version of the creation can be easily understood from the fact that this account reflects the unscientific mind or method of thought and the attitude of churchmen, both Romanist and reformer, during and immediately following the Dark Ages. In this account, they ignore the Creator's undeviating law that only by and through the medium of the heavenly sun do we get to our morning and evening. The doctors have given us mornings and evenings for three days before they have God create the sun, sun, who is himself recognized also as the creator, the arbiter and ruler of the day and the night. This is in accordance with the conception of the Irish Magian adepts that the universe was brought into manifestation through a series of emanations. The first came from one, a center, which they called tos, the beginning or first cause containing the elements of all. From this one proceeded two, the father-mother, the male-female principle of creation. And from these two, a third was created, the son, son, through whom all the rest was created. The doctors have grass and fruit trees growing and bringing forth their kind on the third day of creation, at a time where the incipient world, owing to the absence of the source of light and heat, was a chaotic mass incapable of sustaining any form of life, either vegetable or animal. In fact, they have committed the absurd error of having the world created before the Creator himself had emerged from the first cause. They decided that the Creator's Son should not be created until the fourth day, thereby flouting one of the most apparent and obvious laws, to modern thought at least, of the universe. 
It is one of the grossest errors ever made by any dominant or self-centered cult or class of which we have any knowledge. It remains only time for only time to eliminate this error. That this will be done, we will plainly we will we see plainly foreshadowed in language attributed to Origen, another transparent forgery. Origen is one of those ancient authors set up for convenient use by the priests to whom they may, might attribute sayings or writings which were uttered by themselves in more recent times as the necessity arose to meet or allay enlightened criticism. Origen is made to say, what man of sense will agree with the statement that the first, second and third days in which the evening is named and the morning were without sun, moon and stars? What man has found such an idiot as to suppose that God planted trees in paradise like a husbandman? I believe that every man must hold these things for images under which a hidden sense is concealed. I do not give any credence to the statement that these words were uttered by Origen, as these words betray a liberality which was foreign to the Roman Church under the Emperor Bishops, as well as the later papacy. If Origen had uttered these words, although he was said to be a father of the Church, they would have been suppressed and not allowed to come down to us. For in those words, <coughs> He not only disregards the letter of the canon, but also violates its spirit as well. It was a practice of the church fathers to keep all outside their own cult in order, or order in ignorance. This is well set forth by Clement of Alexandria, who says, The truths of the scripture were not meant for all men. The ancient wise men placed men into two categories, wise men and fools. The wise were those who would apprehend the truth, and the fools those who must accept that and that was spread before them. So the statement attributed to Origen is manifestly spurious and is, I believe, the result of an afterthought of the priests, in order to meet the growing enlightenment whim finally led to the Reformation. It also served the purpose of giving the stamp of age to this apparent forgery. What enlightened man of today can believe that if such words were uttered by Origen, who was said to have lived in the second century of our era, they would have been allowed to escape commitment to the flames at the hands of the Roman censors. That is what happened to practical to, that is what happened to practically all of the literature of the ancient times, which could be of value to us, that the church authorities could lay hands upon. It is safe to say that if Origen had written those words, they would have never been preserved for us. The name Origen is evidently a fictitious one assumed by the Roman priest scribe historian. It is a variant form of Erigen, and it pertains to Irie. Thus, the philosopher John Scotus Irigena has been given the appellation Irigena because he was an Irishman born in Irie. The letter zero, or O, in the Gaelic has the soft round of the English letter E, so Origen would read Erigen of Erie. The fact that Roman that the Roman Church claims Origen said to have lived in the second century AD as one of the fathers of her church is proof in itself that she has laid claim to what pertained to the early as the ancient Christian church and belonged to Irie and which was never hers. The Roman church has no genuine Christian background of her own dating back to the time of origin but she has gone further and synchronized her history back to Peter in the first century of our era which is a false claim as both Peter and Paul are fictitious characters, absolutely, and never existed as individuals. Rome took form as a Christian church at the Council of Nice in the year 325 AD, when she adopted the Irish saver Iessa as her own. Any genuine Christian data before this time must naturally pertain to the time-honoured and ancient Christian church of Irie. So it can be seen that Origen could not be one of the fathers of the Roman church, as he had said as he is said to have lived two centuries before that church had its birth. It has not been the purpose or practice of Rome to give out or explain the truth. All that she has preserved for posterity was altered and made over to conform her viewpoint or interest. Therefore, all this serves but to make, a, make plain that the account of the general creation is out of harmony and inconsistent with the recondite and esoteric wisdom which is embodied and which has been left out of the ancient Irish scriptures by the doctors.